Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I'll give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Jessica Himes. She is a paraplegic Olympian, and that's all I'm going to give you. I'm really excited to talk to her today and hear a little bit more about her. So Jessica, why don't you go ahead and tell us about your life? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So in a nutshell, the thing I'm most identify with is just being a two-time Paralympic athlete for Team USA. So the Paralympics, um, just to explain that a little, is the sister or parallel games to the Olympics. The Olympics are for uh, professional able-bodied athletes, and the Paralympics are for professional disabled athletes. Um, I have a disability of a leg amputation. So when I was born, I was diagnosed with amniotic banding syndrome. This was caused by issues in the womb. Uh, It's where all the amniotic sacs wrap around the fetus and cause developmental issues. For some people, this affects arms and legs. And for me, this affected my right leg. So at birth, I had um, shorter bones all in my right leg and I had a very deformed partial foot. I had one toe and it had absolutely no function whatsoever. It was just sort of there. So for a year, my parents tried to save my foot and they tried to trade like club foot and the doctors would cast it and see if it, you know, would overcorrect back and it ended up not being a functional leg. So after a year, they decided best course of action for myself would be to amputate. So now my leg was amputated right around the ankle calf region. So I have all three major leg bones, but I have no foot. So I got my first uh, prosthetic when I was a year old. And ever since then, roughly once a year or so, during my growth years, I got a new prosthetic and I learned to walk and compete in sports and sort of navigate the world with those prosthetics. And I thankfully grew up in a time that was very um, developmental for prosthetics. Um, My first leg was actually carved out of wood, (laughs) which is very, very ancient. (laughs) And now my legs have the technology of carbon fiber springs. And some people have the um, plug in legs and arms that actually have robotic functions. Um, I personally don't, but I have a lot more technology than was available to me at birth or even through the majority of my growing years. So thankfully that helped me get into sports. I started off sports using just my regular walking leg, which is designed to have a foot on the bottom that has a carbon fiber plate inside. Um, and I would run around and play um, my, most of my sports with that leg and I got into running slash track and field when I was about 10 years old. Uh, I did that because my older sister at the time had just joined middle school cross country and I wanted to be just like her. So I begged my parents to sign me and my younger sister up for a track club. So they did that. And I just found that I absolutely love the freedom of running. Uh, without most other sports with teams, uh, you know, you work together as a cohesive unit, but I found that with track and field, it was me against myself. I mean, it was against other people as well, but I could really measure my progress just on that. And that was really important for me as someone who didn't always measure up to the same as other people my age, because I couldn't you know, function the same way with my prosthetics. That really allowed me to just focus on um, getting better personally and not necessarily comparing about how I would let down a team or something. So I got into that and I absolutely loved it. And it was at that time that my prosthetist decided to get me a running prosthetic. And that one is basically a J shape of a carbon fiber plate. And it acts as sort of a spring to push you forward. Most regular prosthetics, like walking ones, they sort of feel like you're walking on a two by four that's like strapped to your foot or like a big hiking boot. It does absolutely nothing to spring you forward. But that running prosthetic tries to mimic you moving forward. So I got that and discovered that I could actually keep up with my teammates and I no longer had to get last in every race because I could actually have the rest of my body move with me and my leg wouldn't hinder me as much as it had been beforehand. So after that, I cut off all other sports and I said, I love track and field. I want to try it all. (laughs) So I had uh, tried all the jumps and the throws and all the sprinting distance events. And I really found my love in running and in discus. 
Um, and then going into high school, I uh, was introduced to the Paralympic movement. And I discovered that there is a whole avenue of sports specifically for disabled uh, youth and disabled athletes. And I absolutely fell in love with the environment and fell in love with the community of disability. And that made me want to pursue Team USA as a Paralympic athlete. So I set my sights on that. And going into my senior year of high school, I was able to make the uh, Team USA team for the Rio de Janeiro Paralympic Games. Uh, That was my first games. And it was the most amazing experience I've ever had in my life. Um, And after that, I had the really unique opportunity to compete collegiately at D1 school, uh, Northern Iowa, where I competed in track and field, and I did sprints and discus. And that led me up to this past year. As a senior, I tried for Team USA again at the Tokyo 2020 slash 2021 games, where I was able to make the team and go to Tokyo to compete. I competed in my classification um, F64 for the discus, and I placed uh, fifth overall in the combined uh, classification. I set an American record there and a personal best. Um, and then after uh, the games, I came home this past fall and decided to go professional and become a professional discus thrower um, and a professional athlete. So that's my little life in a nutshell, <laughs> in a few minutes condensed. <laughs> so kind of going from the beginning, Obviously, I'm sure you don't remember when you were like one years old, uh, getting your first prosthetic. But since you were growing and had to get one every year, was there a learning curve? Like you kind of had to relearn to walk every single year you'd get a new one? Yeah, there definitely was. And, you know, because I never learned to walk regularly with like two full legs and two full feet, my brain just sort of comprehended that, okay, every year I'm going to sort of relearn how to walk and navigate with that. And thankfully, as technology has developed, my prosthetics don't require as much adaptation because they can make legs that are specifically meant for your like body type and your style of movement and activity. So thankfully now it feels very easy, like just changing out a pair of shoes and I can get new styles as it goes. But yeah, growing up, it was definitely a big curve, but, um, I mean, kids' brains are absolutely amazing. Now my parents said that it was cool to see my body just react like, okay, this is new, but I can figure out how to make it work. Um, cause you never expect a toddler to be able to make adjustments like that, but our bodies are so in tune to doing that. Uh, so they said it was really cool to witness that. <laughs> and do you have to do something special for wearing shoes? So I don't anymore. So uh, thankfully in prosthetics, they make feet um, with centimeter sizes. So I give my prosthetist the size of centimeters that my left foot is. And then we order a prosthetic that matches that. And I usually get mine a few centimeters shorter than my actual foot because I used to have an issue where I wouldn't be able to fit it in certain shoes. (laughs) So now I get it a little smaller. So it fits in most shoes that I prefer to wear. Uh, At the time, I don't have a high heel foot. Because my prosthetic doesn't have a movable ankle, it's set in a certain like 90 degree angle. So unfortunately, I don't have a prosthetic that adapts to high heels. That's something I really want to sort of on my wish list if that ever happens. Um, But the technology does exist for that. And I have a lot of friends who have those feet. And that really widens the arena of shoes that they can wear. But thankfully, most shoes fit the prosthetics nowadays. (laughs) That's, I never even thought of like a prosthetic that the ankle like could be adjustable, that high heels could even be a thing. Yeah. Well, it's that and flip flops. So most prosthetics don't have slits between the toes. And I think I was in, I had one, like I would call it flip flop foot. I had one of those split toe feet and I was, when I was in middle school at one point. And then when I got to college, I finally got another one. And for years, I never wore flip flops because it wouldn't stay on my foot. But thankfully now, they I do have one that has that little slit so I can wear sandals and everything because you wouldn't believe how difficult it is to find a shoe that doesn't have a heel or a toe slit. <laughs> no matter of season, like I want boots, but they all have heels and I want sandals, but they all have toe slits. So thankfully, my prosthetic fits most shoes. But yeah, it surprises people because you don't expect that to be an issue. You just sort of forget that that's something that regular feet have that you'd have to adjust for a prosthetic. <laughs> right. 
Now, are you still getting prosthetics often? Uh, not anymore. When I was growing, I'd have to get them almost yearly. And there was a point where I had like four a year just during my growth spurt because they're molded so specifically to your leg. Um, they actually take like, they cast your leg as if you broke an arm or like it broke a bone. And that's how they mold your leg. So you can't just order a new one online as you grow. And when you have a growth spurt, there's no way to predict what your leg or bones are going to do, particularly if you had a congenital disability like mine, where my muscles and nerves and bones are all a little bit messed up. So I usually once per year had that. And now that I'm in college or now that I, once I went to college, I no longer got that once a year because I had stopped growing and we had more of a permanent setup. So mine is now made of carbon fiber um, all the way through which is much more durable than mine (laughs) were as a child, but I also don't have rough play with it anymore. So it's meant to last a little longer. And thankfully it's uh, fit me for like five or six years now. Now, do you know, is this congenital disease like super common, super rare? Yeah, it's pretty rare. I don't recall the um, number off the top of my head, but I know majority of people with lower leg amputations from birth, they're either fibular hemimelia or amniotic banding, but it's a lot more rare to find amniotic band patients. And what was it like growing up? Did people treat you differently because of this? Yeah, I had, I I mean, I had a few people bully me through elementary. That's sort of the time where kids are learning about the world and other people. And that was something that they had never come in contact with before. But thankfully, my family did a really good job of um, helping me to sort of accept and understand my disability before I got to that stage. Uh, So they didn't, um, there are like two sort of extremes you can do. You can sort of ignore that it even exists and like not talk about it, say it's fine, you know, it happens, we're not going to pay attention to it. Or you go on the other extreme and like hyper fixate on it and say, oh my gosh, this affects every part of your life. You know, we're going to put this as your entire identity. Thankfully, my family did a good job of finding somewhere in between. I mean, yes, it affects you. Yes, you have to adapt normal things in your life, but it's not your entire identity and you have other qualities and characteristics outside of that. Uh, So thankfully, that from a young age was something they really paid attention to. And so once I got to the stage where uh, kids started making fun of me because they weren't sure what was going on, they were just um, not really comfortable with it. I was comfortable enough with myself that I was able to sort of move through that and sort of educate people on that. Obviously, as a young kid, I didn't understand all the dynamics, but my parents and my sisters did a good job of like helping me understand that people usually are just aren't that comfortable with it because they haven't experienced it before and they aren't sure. They have a lot of questions and they don't know exactly how to bring it up. So they really taught me to, you know, advocate for myself and talk about it. And not make it something that makes other people uncomfortable because they don't feel like they can learn about it. Um, so yeah, they did a great job of helping me understand like I'm different and that's not a bad thing. Right. And that's so great to have such supportive parents and siblings to be able to find that good middle ground and not go to either extreme. Now, um, I'm going to make the assumption that you cannot wear the prosthetic all the time, specifically like in the shower. Um, so what sort of situations are there that, you know, you need to change it out? Yeah. So shower is the number one time for some patients, they are able to get water prosthetics or coverings so they can wear them. This is really important if you have like mobility issues or balance issues. Uh, for me, I grew up hopping around on my left leg before I learned to really run on both. And so for me, balance isn't too much of an issue with that. So in the shower, I do take my prosthetic off and I usually stand on one leg, um, which does get tricky when you're in hotels or an area where you are not used to the shower. <laughs> but yeah, that's one time I take it off. And other than that, usually just to sleep is when I don't have it on. But as uh, as a child, I would come home and I basically take my shoes off and take my leg off and hop around or sort of hobble around. It was just more comfortable for me that way. Uh, I am able, thankfully, when I'm on a plane or in a car, I can take my prosthetic off. Then I just have a lot more room for my other leg. And that's just a very random benefit slash side effect that I have. I get a little extra leg room from that. 
um, yeah, sometimes even when we're just watching a movie, I just take off my leg to be more comfortable and sort of cozy up. But other than that, most of the time, for me personally, I wear it around because that gives me the most mobility and freedom. But some days you just get sick of it. Like, I don't want to put this on right now. Hang around in the bed or on the couch and not wear it for a while. <laughs> and I mean, if you have that balance and have been honing in on the balance and the hopping since being young, it's kind of like, well, why not? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Thankfully, I'm very much used to it. (laughs) Now, you mentioned that you got into the Paralympics when I believe you were in high school. So how did that come about? And what was that story to kind of be like, this is something I'm not interested in, I'm going to go for it? Yeah. So my mom was on, I believe she's on Facebook one day, just scrolling through things. And she found a page for um, this adaptive me down in Oklahoma City. And she read up on it and heard that it was for, or learned about that it was for um, adaptive athletes of all ages, but it's geared towards uh, youth and um, adaptive children. And we had no idea this world was even a thing. We I never heard of it, but we decided that is going to be our summer vacation <laughs> for the time. So we made a plan and uh, we sat down as a family and my parents said, we're going to try this. We have no idea if we're going to hate it or not. If we try it for one day inside, this isn't our thing. We'll find something else to do in Oklahoma city. But if we end up loving it, we'll enjoy the whole week. And we got down there and absolutely fell in love with the environment right away. Uh, for me, it was just, it was really impactful to be in an environment where the whole community understands. Um, I, cause before I ended all my sports experience was with children who didn't have any sort of physical disability. And so I was just used to knowing that, okay, I'll probably be slower than them in this. I probably won't be able to do this or have to adapt it in a way that no one else really understands why or how I'm doing it. But once I got there, that wasn't even a problem. You know, everyone expected, you know, you go into a building, okay, where's the elevator? Where's the ramp? Because we have people that want to do this and need this. And so we just casually do that. And you know, everyone has their prosthetics laying around on the ground and it's not a problem. We're comparing legs and everything and stories. And it was just a really unique, unique environment that I had no idea even existed. My family didn't either. And we love that community of understanding and being able to compete alongside athletes that had so many different disabilities, ones I had never even heard of at the time that really grew my love for the sport. And it it impacted me so positively that once we came back home, we're like, we have to make this a regular thing. I need to be more like be at these meets more, even if it's not to compete, just to be in that environment. So yeah, that absolutely, I fell in love with it. And it was there that I was told about the Paralympics and how this isn't like, you don't just have to do this as a casual event. You can also do this professionally and, you know, as an elite athlete. So then what was it like trying out and, being accepted to go to Rio? It was very crazy. I went into it not really knowing if I would make it and sort of expecting that I wouldn't. Uh, At the time that I tried out, I was 16 or 17 years old. So I was very young (laughs) and I had only been uh, competing against adult and elite athletes for about two years at that point. So I thankfully knew some of the other athletes that were there and they could sort of coach me through like, okay, this will be sort of a scary experience, but here's, you know, what you're going to see and what you're going to, you know, have to do. And I remember trying out for the 400 and I tried it for the 400 and the discus. And I went and went to line up with the 400. I looked to my right and there was the world record holder of the 400 meters. I'm like, Oh my gosh, like she is, really famous. She paved the ways for all of us. This is absolutely insane. What am I doing here? (laughs) And that was bizarre for me, but in the same sense, I felt very comfortable and it felt very natural for me to be in that environment. I was like, I kind of feel like I don't belong only because I'm young and I haven't done this before, but it felt very right to be there. And I mean, once I found out that I made it, I just I bawled the entire time my family and I were together when we found out and we were just hugging and crying and we had to pinch ourselves and say, okay, is, this is actually happening. And this is actually a thing, you know, this isn't just a dream anymore. It's a reality. And that was, that was really cool to experience. 
And then what was Rio like? It was insane. So um, just to give a brief history of the Paralympics, um, Rio was a very sort of divisive um, games in the sense that the Olympics usually uh, occur about two to three weeks ahead of the Paralympics. And at the time, we had just found out that the Olympic Committee hosting at Rio had used up all the Paralympic fund money for the Olympics, and we had no money left for the Paralympics. So the few weeks leading up to that was very scary for the athletes, not knowing if the games would even happen at all, um, which, of course, we had the same feelings four years later. <laughs> but uh, it was – I know for a lot of the other athletes that were older and really understood the economics and political side of all that, it was really scary not knowing when they would happen, if at all. And thankfully, once we got there and we knew, okay, you know, they found the money, they found the funds, and we are going to make this something worthwhile. We are going to show, you know, everyone who decided to take away all the Paralympic funding and Paralympic um, ability that, you know, we're here, we mean business. And it was absolutely phenomenal. The I was there for two weeks down in Brazil, and the whole thing was basically a fever dream <laughs> like for me um the so all the athletes stay in one village complex basically which is about like 20 high-rise buildings of apartments and they have like entertainment centers this giant um like food uh court area and tons of outdoor recreation and so you're put there with the best athletes in the world and it was amazing to walk around and see Everyone from all different countries uh, representing their uh, their area of the world. When you're in the village, you wear only uh, whatever team's clothing um, you represent. So we had all of our Team USA gear, which I was stoked to have. I was giddy like a school child wearing it the whole time. But um, yeah, I was. It, I'm like my favorite part was just seeing everyone in all of their clothing. And seeing like, oh my gosh, they're from this area of the world. They're from a country I didn't even know existed. <laughs> like, this is insane. <laughs> um, and then once I went to the Olympic Stadium, which is the track and field facilities, that was a real sort of um, arm pinching moment for me. I was able to walk in on a day that they had no competitions, and uh, we sort of snuck into view the area and see okay what's the competition venue look like what can we expect when we walk in and it was just this huge gorgeous gorgeous blue track and I mean that at the time that was the largest venue I had ever stepped foot in and seeing that was so amazing I mean I had seen pictures of it ahead of time but just the massive the sheer mass of that was so incredible and yeah I once I saw that, I was like, okay, I want competition day to be here because I want to see this. This feels so amazing to be here. <laughs> so then what was competition day like being up against people from various different regions of the world? It was absolutely crazy. I personally think that my uh, discus was sort of the craziest. Uh, that one, I was the youngest by, I believe, at least 10 years because uh, throwers typically have a longer lifespan for their uh, uh, career in sports. And I got into it quite young. And so being there, I was like, oh my gosh, these people have like so many Paralympics under their belt. They've been to so many games before. They have years of doing this. This is like my first time being out of games and I don't know what to expect. And that was just nuts for me. And thankfully I was able to make finals in the discus uh, which was super cool. I barely snuck in there and I finished eighth and I had a huge PR and I, uh, I credit all that to having just a huge adrenaline rush of being there. <laughs> uh, thankfully my um, parents and my sisters and one set of my grandparents were able to actually fly to Rio to support me. So they were in the stands there with me and it was really amazing to look back after I was throw and see them cheering me on and waving their flags. Um, that really brought me, you know, back to reality every time I sort of got freaked out about being in the stadium. Um, and it really humbled me just seeing them because 
you know, the family, they were the people who got me to where I was and they supported me through every part of my journey to Rio. So seeing them there, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, you know, we made it. It was no longer like, and I made it thing. I was like, oh, we made it. You know, we did this and we are finally in the stadium. And that was, it was an amazing experience. <laughs> yeah. And that's so sweet. And that they were able to, to get out there with you. Now, were you able, like, did you have time to leave the village and spend time in Rio with your family? Yes. Usually after games, we have a few days or like maybe a week that we have to leave and we can go with our family and then we can stay as long as we'd like if we want to fly back on our own. And so thankfully, I was able to spend, I believe, two or three days with my family. Uh, We travel around, saw Christ Redeemer, I saw Copacabana and Ipanema and uh, just really toured the culture. And that's something I love. I, I'm i very much into immersing into the culture of wherever I travel to. And in the village, you don't get that in the same way. It's a very different culture because every culture is intermingled there. And so I really enjoy the ability to leave the village and experience the area I was in. So then flash forward uh, to 2020 or 2019, when you would have been trying out for... Tokyo, what was the Tokyo experience like? Yeah, so (laughs) it was because of a pandemic, everything was pushed back a year. So for track and field, we usually try out for the team two to three months ahead of time. So for the 2020 games, we were supposed to be in June of 2020. And when the pandemic hit and it was March or April when the decision was made to push back the games, Track was one of the sports that wasn't um, didn't make a decision on the team already. So some sports they knew, and so the athletes said, okay, I made the team. I just have to wait another year before I compete. For people like me, we were sort of thrown into a, oh, my gosh, we don't, you know, we don't have a games, and now we don't know if we're going to make the team for next year. You know, <laughs> what do we do with that? So, uh, uh, I mean, thankfully, it. I was very much humbled in the fact that that was – not the largest problem in the world at the moment, you know, I was able to realize like, it's a privilege to have that, you know, honor at all. So I was, thankfully, I was in a position where I could still somewhat train, uh, find ways around that to keep my athletic ability at the same level for another year. Uh, With the Paralympic athletes, a lot of us had more issues trying to train because our facilities were shut down. And with our running prosthetics and racing chairs most of those don't work on like grasses or roads and so we can't train the same way but thankfully we um all were able to stick together somehow (laughs) and figure out training and then um our trials were officially announced to be of june of 2021 and those were held in minneapolis minnesota this past summer which feels like a lifetime ago (laughs) um i uh decided that spring that I wanted to um, not compete in sprinting for the trials. I just wanted to focus on discus. So I made that decision and I went to the trials for the discus. And thankfully I was able to make the team. It was a difficult trials for everybody for many reasons, but thankfully that once the team was announced um, a week later than normal, um, which was this whole thing, usually they announce it the day after trials ends in this year, they waited a whole week. So we found out we were all able to go home and we found out on Zoom and it was the most stressful week of my life (laughs) waiting for that announcement Um, once they were able to make it. uh, We really all sort of hunkered down and made a uh, sort of a plan for the next two months to stay healthy and how to train, how to make sure we don't get COVID because anyone that was positive for COVID through the summer was not able to go to the games. So we really hunkered down. That was my mind like flipped and said, okay, this has finally happened. We went like two full years for Tokyo to finally occur. And thankfully I was able to fly out beginning of August. And I was there in Tokyo for about a month, uh, which is a little longer than I usually would. But we left two weeks early to stay at the Air Force Base. And that was partially for COVID safety and partially to acclimate to the weather. It was very hot and humid there. And a lot of athletes are in issues at the Olympics that went a few weeks before us. So with our athletes, some of them have issues regulating body temperature and adjusting to um, heat and 
humidity. So we went early to make sure that we could figure out how best to adjust our bodies when it comes to, you know, go time. So I had a good experience with that. And about three, three and a half weeks in, I finally competed in the discus. (laughs) And it was definitely a different experience. At this games, there were no outside spectators. Uh, So coaches and other track athletes were allowed in the track venue. But other than that, the stadium was empty. And that was a very different experience. I thankfully had an experience of a game where the stands were completely full. But for athletes who didn't have that, it was really hard to gauge, you know, what to expect. Because you go into it thinking, like, this is the biggest moment of your life. It's going to be, like, sort of like a movie where there's a lot of energy and a huge crowd. And when you walk into the stadium and there isn't that loud crowd response, you know, how do you get your body and mind ready to compete? So thankfully, I was able to draw in from my previous previous experience from Rio and my experience with my NCAA season this past spring that mostly had no spectators. So I was sort of used to that environment. So I, it was difficult to sort of tune in to make all of your energy come from within and not from your energy outside. Because as athletes, a lot, especially you know, track athletes, high energy, we really draw from the crowd. So that was difficult. But um, thankfully, I was able to pull through. And I mean, by the time I got to the ring, my mindset was purely focused on gratitude of being there. As I know, it was not easy for the country of Japan to host this. You know, they went through a lot to even have the games in the first place. And I was grateful to even make the team. I didn't know if I was. I had a horrible season leading up to the trials. So, you know, my mind was in a lot of places. But I had really focused on just being grateful to even be there. And I I had to do a little self to self talk and say, you know, even if you don't get a placement or a distance that you want, you are grateful for being here. And it's a blessing to, you know, be at the games at all, much less my second game. So I thankfully I did have a good meet and I uh, was able to set American record. So I left very proud of myself and (laughs) it was overall a very good games for me. (laughs) Now, the people who are on your team, are you like practicing with them in the States beforehand or are some of them like you don't even like know until you get to Tokyo? A little bit of both. So uh, there are different areas throughout the country where groups of para track athletes train and compete together. One of them would be at the former Olympic Training uh, Center, now the Elite Athlete Training Center in Chula Vista, California. That's a residency program where some track athletes live full time. So they live there and train there and they know that group there. And there are a few other ones scattered throughout the country. Uh, My university, I actually had another sprinter who is in a blind division. Uh, She and I both made the team. So she was an athlete that I sort of trained with, but we were in different, uh, different events. So we didn't exactly train together every single day. But I at least knew her. And I knew most of the athletes going into it from previous years, but she went into it only knowing me. And so that was sort of uh, a fun way to um, have me introduce her to everyone that I've known from the years prior and then also get to know the athletes that were new and had just joined the para movement. And getting into a bit of the nitty gritty with the Paralympics, can you explain how like there's obviously like there's different sports and then there's different disabilities. So how do different events occur? Yeah. So with the Paralympics, we had 22 different events um, at this past games. Uh, The majority of them are ones that also have Olympic counterparts. So track and field, for example, or basketball or volleyball, they have Olympic counterparts. Um, There are, there are one or two that don't have, um, Olympic counterparts, one that would be bocce ball, and um, gold ball is the other one. So for track and field, we have Olympic counterpart. Um, and for the Olympics, they are separated into two categories, is male and female. And for Paralympics, we have male and female. And then after that, we divide further into subdivisions of disability. So each sport divides disability differently, depending on how the disability affects the performance of that sport. For track and field, um, I don't know off the top of my head the number of categories because they're numbered sort of weird, but I am labeled as a 64, 
which means a lower leg amputation. So when I compete, I, for discus particularly, my 64 category is combined with a 44 category, which is lower, lower leg impairment. Uh, these athletes have both legs, but they have some sort of muscular and neurological issue that causes them um, a lack of mobility within their foot and their lower leg. Uh, for most events, we try to have only specific categories compete against that specific category. So in a perfect world, we would only have 64s compete against 64s. So it would be people with similar amputations. Uh, sometimes due to numbers or due to history of the events, they combine that, them just like mine was combined. But for the most part, when you watch an event, it will, like if you watch on TV, they will label the category or categories that the athletes are in and then the event. So for track and field, not every category has every single event. This is because if you have 20 categories and every category has every single event, you're going to have about a billion different track and field events just in our sport. So for me, my 64 category has the 100, the 200, the long jump, and the discus. And just last week, they announced that Paris 24 will have the shot put as well. So that's just what we have for women in my category. Um, it depends on the sport. And I don't know all, um, what the other sports exactly how theirs are categorized because it's a lot. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just by male and female. And then uh, division of disability is how we differentiate our categories. Right. And that that makes sense. And is definitely fascinating when you think about, like, if you're just disability 64, like just how many options there are and how, like even just in the two categories you were just explaining, similar, but also very different. Yes. Yeah. There's a whole spectrum of disability. And that's something I love learning about as I've gotten more into the para and adaptive world. It just, the absolute range there is, um, like even with athletes with a prosthetic that looks and functions like mine, the amount of different diagnoses and the causes of that range so much. Uh, and that's been something that's been a real joy for me to do is just learn more about the world because it's it seems to be an endless spectrum of the disabilities that there are. And it's been really cool to learn. Is there like a, a limit on how many people a country can send because there are so many different categories? Yes. So that varies by sport. So for track and field, we have a cap number of 32 women and 42 men, I believe. Most other sports I know of, it's even among men and women. For track, unfortunately, it's not even among both. So in the year leading up to the games, there's a whole calculation that the track and field, the para track and field international uh, committee does where they calculate the amount of medal competitors per country and then we have up to that many slots. Uh, so for women track and field this past year, I believe we had 20, between 20 and 25 and 28 women that um, had slots open. But they allot us those um, the spring or the few weeks leading up to trials. And that trials, they learn, okay, we have this many women that can make the team. That's what they allotted us as a country. So we get that. We're a larger country, so we're more likely to be at the upper end. But countries that are smaller have usually a smaller number of athletes that they can send because they don't have as many athletes on average competing at that same level. Right. Now, what has your NCAA experience been like? Yes, it's been amazing. Uh, going into uh, college, or like my senior year of high school, I knew I wanted to compete collegiately, but there weren't a lot of opportunities for disabled athletes. Uh, particularly at D1, which was where I ended up competing at. So I was super nervous going around looking at schools and you know, trying to convince them basically to take me on because by that time in my career, I was competitive against other able-bodied athletes. But it's a whole different world going to college. And more than that, I would be competing not just for the NCAA season, but I'd be planning to compete to peak at the summer events, which were the pair events. So not every school, you know, understandably, I guess, was looking forward to having an athlete that wanted to peak later than they wanted their athletes to peak. And unfortunately, some of them weren't comfortable with using a disabled 
um, athlete on their team and figuring out how to adapt the programs and adapt the training. So I thankfully found a home at Northern Iowa and, you know, there the coaches immediately, they were like, look, I've never trained with a disabled athlete. I don't know much about the Paralympics, but I want to learn. I want to educate myself. And this is something we're super interested in. So they took me up right away. And I mean, it was amazing. I had four wonderful years there where I was able to compete and train alongside my able-bodied teammates. And they were really just right away super invested in the para movement and the Paralympics. And they were so much more supportive than I ever expected a school to be. Um, yeah, it was such a blessing to have that NCAA experience. And thankfully, that avenue is opened up for a lot more disabled athletes. Uh, when I first started, I was among the first that had that opportunity. And now in Tokyo, we had almost 50% of our athletes um, among all of Team USA's para-athletes compete collegiately, which is a huge, huge growth from what it was even just four or five years prior. So I had such an amazing, such amazing and blessed <laughs> opportunity to compete collegiately. And what sort of things did the school need to do to be able to accommodate your disability? So for like most and foremost was the uh, training day to day. So for discus, um, my technique, I use the same technique and style as able-bodied athletes, but the way that I function through it is quite different. You know, I, um, a lot of discus is being low and bending your ankle and your knee. I have a very weak right knee and I don't have a right ankle at all. And so that movement is very different for me. And my coach actually, he had a very wonderful time trying to understand what I felt because for him, he couldn't accurately coach me until he knew what I felt when I tried to do different events. And so there was a day where he, <laughs> he ended up putting his knee on like a rotating chair and trying to spin through it. And he's like, okay, this is sort of what you feel like because you can't feel the bottom of it, but you can feel like the top of your hip spinning. And then there was a day where I was like, coach, try doing this drill, but instead of being on your toe, being on your heel. And he did that. And I was like, that's what it feels like for me on this side. And after that, he, was, he said like, oh my gosh, now I understand the movement. And after going through that, he could sort of visualize different drills and ways that I could get the same effect just through slightly different movements. Uh, so just those day-to-day -day things were the biggest things my coaches had to do, but it was really beneficial. And it was really cool to see them work through that and take so much time and effort. Um, alongside with that, there were some um, programs that have um, education on adaptive weightlifting and adaptive like weight training to show like how do you train an athlete that can't do some of the regular lifts. Like for example, I can't do double leg squats because my right femur is actually shorter than my left femur by about three inches. So if I go a certain depth in my squats, my hips are all off because my knees are at different heights too. So I can't do most of those without hurting my back. So we had to really adapt and do more band work as opposed to the typical Olympic style lifts. And now what is it like and what does it mean to be a professional athlete for you? It's amazing. I, you know, it's something that I never really thought would happen. And I thankfully have the opportunity to. And once I decided that I didn't want to continue with like post-grad schooling, that I wanted to go professional, it was a decision that was sort of difficult to really finally press the button and say, yes, I'm doing this because it's something that is, you know, so far from what I ever pictured my life to be able to be. But being able to do this, it's, you know, it just shows all the growth that I've had through my life. And, you know, knowing that my parents and like held me as a baby, not knowing if I would ever be able to, you know, move and function and play sports with my sisters. And now I'm at a level where I can be an elite professional athlete. Um, it's humbling, honestly. <laughs> it's humbling to even be um, calling myself a professional athlete. And I think I forget sometimes that I am in this position, <laughs> but it's a blessing. <laughs> And is the hope to go to Paris in 2024? Yep, I decided I want to try for Paris. So for the next three years, this, um, at least for the moment, that will be my goal. 
Now, is there anything else that you would like to share with the listeners, whether about your athletic abilities or your life outside of athletics and being uh, a paraplegic? Yeah. So really the one thing I encourage anyone listening um, to do is honestly check out the upcoming Paralympics. We have winter Paralympics in 100 days. Um, The winter Olympics and Paralympics are really close to the summer ones this year because of the postponement for Tokyo, but they're coming up and the entire world of Paralympics is so fascinating. Um, So I really encourage everyone to check that out when that occurs and, you know, find local or regional events where there are para um, sports, Uh, wheelchair basketball, wheelchair rugby have, and Sydney volleyball, they have tons of different para events throughout the country. And they are such a joy to watch and learn about. And everyone that uh, has tapped into the Paralympic world has absolutely found a love in some sport that they had no idea existed. So absolutely check those out and, you know, cheer on Team USA as our winter Paralympic athletes are going to, you know, absolutely tear up the courses (laughs) here in a few months. (laughs) Awesome. Now at the end of all of my episodes with all of my guests, I do ask a random question That doesn't have to do with what we've been talking about. So since we're getting to the end of the year, this episode's going to come out in December. What are you looking forward to most about 2022? Hmm. Well, my younger sister is in nursing school right now, and she'll be graduating next August. So I look forward to clapping her on as she celebrates the hard years of work that she's had. All right, that brings this episode to a close. I'll be leaving Jessica's TikTok handle in the description. And on her TikTok, she also links to good resources about the Paralympics and different events and things like that. So feel free to click through to get to that information and see the fun things that she is doing on TikTok. And of course, if you would like to connect with the podcast, our website is in the description as well. So that brings you to all of our past episodes brings you to our social media, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and also in the description is how you can support this podcast monetarily and the email address if you would like to be a guest. So I love connecting with people and hearing new wonderful stories. So thank you so much, Jessica, for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.